Hello, and welcome to The Scott Mize Show, a podcast focused on health, diet, bodybuilding, and philosophy. I interview experts, doctors, coaches, and N equals one case studies to answer your questions about improving health, achieving your best physique, and making sustainable progress. We'll cover topics from carnivore and ketogenic diets, to bodybuilding, to life philosophy, and everything in between. Enjoy the show. This episode is brought to you by LMNT Electrolytes. This month, we're switching it up with an exclusive offer that's only for VIP LMNT partners, including Carnivore Cast listeners. You can now receive this free sample pack along with any regular purchase when you use my custom link, which is provided in the show notes or my Instagram link in bio. That's drinklmnt.com forward slash carnivorecast, all one word. And as I said, I'll include the link in the show notes. LMNT electrolytes are convenient evidence-based and delicious and get yours today to help support the show. Thank you. This is a quick disclaimer before we start the show. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Nothing said here should be taken as medical advice. And please consult with your physician before making any changes to your diet, exercise regime, or medications. Thank you. And on to the show. Chris Tuttle is a registered dietitian, retired IFBB professional bodybuilder, and contest prep coach. He started Tuttle Nutrition in 2011, enabling him to better share his extensive knowledge of nutrition and exercise with his clients, specifically offering services and expertise in weight loss, sports performance, contest preparation, medical nutrition therapy, bodybuilding, fitness, and figure competitions, and educational lectures. Chris, Chris holds a bachelor's and master's in nutrition, as well as countless ongoing education in the field, and he's constantly staying up to date with the latest research. Welcome to the show, Chris. Awesome, man. I appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, so I'd love to start with a little of your background for, for folks who aren't as familiar. Um, what first got you into bodybuilding and, and how long have you been coaching as well? Um, it's, it's a long story, but a long story short, um, I raced motocross most of my life. Oh, cool. I started riding dirt bikes when I was five and I started racing around age nine and um, I was very, very serious into it. And my parents said, if you want to, it looks like you're very passionate about this. We will be willing to hire a trainer, a motocross trainer for you. And then he came in he's like, dude, you got to cut out the chips. You got to cut out this crap. <laughs> you got to eat this way and you got to train this way. And the training we more consistent to like, a CrossFit style workout, not exactly, but more or less like barbell row, deadlift, squat, lunge, you know, core exercises, but in a giant set format mm. of like uh, high intensity pace and cardio. And that's my introduction to like weight training and nutrition. Even though I was doing it to benefit motocross, my body changed quickly. And like in sixth grade, like I had abs, like my shoulders were rounded and capped. Wow. So like, I didn't notice, I didn't know that was like a desirable thing, but I remember like one, at the end of the year in sixth grade, like we all go to this like pool social and the girls were like, oh my God, Chris is jacked. And I'm like, <laughs> I got to know what that meant. And he was like, oh, look at your abs. I thought everybody had abs. You know, like I thought it was like a normal thing. Sixth so, grade. <laughs> so I was like, whoa, like I didn't know that training can make your body like that. So then I wanted to train more to look like that. And my trainer is like, dude, what are you doing? Bodybuilding and motocross is like trying to become a sumo wrestler and run a marathon. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> it doesn't, they don't mix. Like you have yeah. to be light on the bike. You got to be extremely aerobically fit. Um, so I had to like, he wouldn't let me train arms. There's a lot of things he wouldn't let me train with. Um, so I always wanted to do that. So after motocross, I mean, after motocross is done, I went directly into bodybuilding. Mm. Um and then like a short snippet before that, when he changed my diet and I started eating four feeds per day in sixth grade, seventh grade, and like focusing on a protein, a carb, and a fat, I felt so much better, like even as a kid. And even then my friends would be like, dude, let's ride our bikes up to the, you know, the, the, uh, the Mart and we'll get some chips. And I would be like, I don't want chips. I want, I want like a sandwich because like I learned so quickly what certain foods made me feel like that even when my friends were like eat chips for lunch or soda, I wouldn't want to do that. Interesting. Um, I, would, yeah. I would always gravitate towards protein, 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 um, only knowing because what it made me feel like, not because of the cosmetic effect long-term. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of like how I started to become more knowledgeable in nutrition. Um, and I was diagnosed with hypoglycemia when I was younger. So 
eating very regimentedly and meals that are not too high in carbohydrates, lower, you know, a, a macro complete based meal of proteins, fats, carbs have a better glycemic control. So I felt that I didn't understand it, but I felt it. I knew that like, if I ate steak, potato and a vegetable, you know, for lunch, I felt way better if I ate a ham sandwich and chips. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, so that's kind of how it started, dude. And then went right into bodybuilding after motocross because my body hurt so bad from racing. Um, and then my body hurts no bad from bodybuilding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. It seems like a lot of successful bodybuilders were doing, were learning about either nutrition or weightlifting through a sport, like a lot of football players or basketball players or things like that. Um, my background is, is different. I was, I'm sure you've helped some um, athletes in, in weight, um, weight class sports, but I was a lightweight rower um, for eight years competitively and in college. And uh, man, the nutrition and uh, resistance training advice was so antiquated. It was like, you don't want to become muscle bound. Don't gain any muscle, especially in your upper body, because it'll just make it harder to make weight. Um, and yeah, the nutrition advice was horrible. The coaches were just like, don't ask, don't tell. As long as you make weight on the day, do whatever you have to do. Yeah. 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 It's like wrestling. Yeah. It's like wrestling. Yeah. Like, it's I worse wrestle. than wrestling, actually, because at least in wrestling, they now have like doctor's notes, which probably doesn't mean much, but lightweight rowing is anything goes and right. you weigh in the night before. So guys would gain and lose 20 to 30 pounds every week and then just binge. Um, it was horrible. It's funny. It's like, so it was funny how many like sports that like high school kids play that like, oh, it's so healthy. It's good for them. It's like horrible. Yeah. Now, like it's horrible for our psyche, develop bad eating disorders. It's too extreme. Absolutely. Yeah, like everybody's like, it's awesome. And everybody's yeah. like, oh, it's terrible. You know? Yeah. No, I mean, they just recently got a, rid of lightweight women's rowing in high school. Talk about eating disorders. That was horrible. Um, imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Imagine. Yeah. So, um, how long have you been coaching and, and how did that get started? Um, I did my first bodybuilding show with my sister's ex-boyfriend who was a bodybuilder. Um, and I had no, idea because back in the day, 2004, 2005, there's no social media. Like you can't find a coach or articles really a lot on coaching or how to diet. Um, or I just did not where to look, but the only person that I knew that was like an avid bodybuilder and competed in multiple NPC shows and won a few overalls was my sister's ex-boyfriend. So I contacted him, mm. helped me out for my first show. My first show, I didn't do very well. The preparation obviously wasn't very good. I, I lost like 36 pounds in like seven weeks. Wow. Um, crash dieted really hard. I ended up getting fifth out of six people. Um, and after that show, I did more research and found Chris Aceto's website. And then I ordered Chris Aceto's championship bodybuilding guide and fat loss tips. And all I wrote, I got his books, read all his books and followed those principles to a T the following year. And I put on like close to 16 pounds of stage weight wow. and then stepped on stage with way better conditioning and then ended up winning novice, novice overall. And then second in the open in a heavier weight class. A light weight, and then the week after, I got second again, and then people in my gym were like, "Dude, you did crazy transformation, yeah, um, this year." And one kid came up to me, who's like one of my best friends now. He's like, "Hey, man, can you help me with my show?" And I go, "Dude, I don't know what I'm doing." Like, <laughs> uh, contrary to people today, right? People do yeah. one show. <laughs> expert. I was I'm like, an oh, expert. Yeah, I have no idea what I'm doing. And he's like, "Well, dude, can you help me?" I'm like, "I." I I sure. Like I said, no, but he's like, no, you'll be fine. Help me. So I helped him. I gave, he charged me, like, I charged him like 50 bucks. He, and then uh, I helped him. And then he did really well, much better than the year before. And then his friend goes, what did you do? He's like, oh, this guy at my gym helped me. He's like, do you think you could talk to him? And that's how my coaching started. I never intended it to be a business. I never intended it to be anything other than people approach me. And it was, I helped that person. And that person wanted knew somebody and the, and it was a word of mouth, word of mouth, word of mouth, word of mouth. And even after having like 15, 16 clients, I never was like, I'm going to be a coach. People just kept asking me and I'm like, I'll just keep helping them. Yeah. Um, and it was fun to see my clients win. And at, at that time I had like a shit ton of natural clients 
And then I remember one show I had like five natural clients all turn pro in the same show. And then after that, all these natural guys were like, oh, can you help me? Can you help me? And then I had one point, I was like, was like 30 natural bodybuilders and like wow. female competitors that I was helping, even though I was enhanced, going that enhanced route. <laughs> so I was going to school at the time as well to be a dietitian. And I was just using the extra money to help bodybuilding. Um, and then when I went to my internship, I actually just like told my clients, like, listen, I got to work on my internship. I can't, I can't be present in your shows. So I stopped all clients when I was away. And then when I finished my internship and I got back and I got my RD exam, the word was out that I got back. And then one of the dudes that I helped turn pro goes, Hey man, can you help me my first pro show? And I said, yes. And then within that month, I think I had like 50 clients. Wow. Like it just it was like, Oh, Chris is back. Maybe he's yeah. helping. And Crazy. then it was like helping general population. Now, can you help my wife? She doesn't want to compete. Yeah but she wants to lose weight. Can you help so-and-so? She's got high blood pressure, unmanaged diabetes. And then it just, that's how it started. And then the ball just kept going this rapidly fast, like so fast yeah. to the point where after, <clears throat> so 2008. So after two and a half years, I was making more money 15 hours a week with coaching than I was full-time as a dietitian. Wow. So I was like, oh man, like, <clears throat> Maybe I should quit dietitian, but I was so worried because you have benefits. Mm. It's a concrete job, yep. you know, but I was like, I think I'm going to do it. And then I, and I cut the, cut the cord in 2000, what, 2014 down to part-time or just per DM, which in my situation at the hospital, because I was like the only like available floater, I could work 40 hours if I wanted to, but I could also work one day if I wanted to. Wow, that's great. So I worked like that in 2014. And then 2015, I decided to say, I'm just pulling the cord. Yeah. Working from home. And right when I worked from home, I'm like, well, now I can take on all these people that have been asking me. Yeah. And then before, like within like two weeks, three weeks of me quitting my job, I had 50 hours of work with clients like right off the rip. Wow. And then later that year, my wife quit her job to help me with billing and all this stuff because I had like, something like 13 grand of bills that people weren't paying. <laughs> and I had no idea. I was just answering yeah. emails, producing results, producing yeah. results. Yeah. I just, I couldn't, I'm not good at the money stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm always like, pay me next week. Not a big deal. Let's keep, <laughs> let's going, you know? Um, so that's how the coaching started, man. And and here we are now. Very I'm very cool. grateful for everything, but it all happened organically. And I hate when people go, yeah. hey, how do I become a coach? I'm like, dude, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> like, do a good job. Have integrity, say what you're gonna say, do what you're gonna say, and like, yeah, in time it's gonna work, you know. Yeah, yeah. Do you did you find that your success as a coach tracked pretty linearly with your success as an athlete, or do you think it was somewhat independent? <clears throat> uh, independent. When I became more successful as an athlete, there was more eyes on me, which started to create the desire to want to work with me. Yeah. Like my reach before I was a professional was like Massachusetts, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And then when I turned pro in 2013, then it started to spread around the country. Okay. And then when I got sponsored by Animal, um, then my my image was projected internationally. Um, and then people were like, dude, you're well-spoken. I like you. It looks like you have integrity. I want to work with you. And then that projected my image and they looked me up and they figure out who I was. And then I had clients in other countries. Yeah. Uh, and then now obviously I haven't been with animal for years, but now it's just that momentum of me helping people in other countries and doing well, you know, and that's yeah. how I ended up starting. Yeah. It's amazing. And, and you've had immense success uh, across the spectrum with tons of different types of clients. Um, and you have total nutrition with your wife. How do you balance um, like, traditional nutrition, lifestyle clients, and bodybuilders today? And what, what makes you prefer? Oh, uh, which one do I like better? Yeah, or like, yeah, what mix do you have personally? And, and, oh, okay. and do you like having a mix or do you prefer to focus on competitors? Okay. Oh, yeah. I like having a mix. I like helping everybody. I mean, helping all bodybuilders gets pretty fatiguing. Yeah, I'm sure. Because a lot of bodybuilders are very, very, very uh, uh, irrational thinkers. They're very emotional people. 
needy. They're very one dimensional. So sometimes it gets a little fatiguing with them. And like at this point in time, like I'm lucky because of my clientele load, but I will fire somebody quickly. If somebody's just like, I'm like, listen, you're fatiguing me. Like, dude, this is, this is a simple pro, pro, uh, program to follow. Communication is vital. But if they're doing all this weird stuff or missing check ins, it's like, dude, you're done. Cancel yeah. next Not person. Um, but I like having about, well, I put a cap. I don't help any more than four competitors per weekend. That's my cap. Yeah. Like I will take on, I think last year I had 114 people compete over the year. Wow. Um, but I make sure there's not more than four people per weekend. Okay. That's because funny. I, it's just not fun for me. Like, yeah, 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 I'm killing it and it's doing well, but like my weekends sucks, you know what yeah. I mean? And then they Especially get done. With time with the show. Zones. Yeah. yeah. Then they get done with the show Saturday and they're like, I want to start my reverse right away. I'm like, dude, I can't get your plan done. Like I haven't gotten yeah. any sleep. I need to go yeah. to sleep. And then Sunday is my only day off per week. And I need to spend it with my wife doing other things. It yeah. just becomes too much, man. You yeah. Know? Yeah. That's um, a lot. But I'd say 30% of my clientele are competitors. And I really just like helping everybody that wants to be helped. Yeah. That's cool. And I saw recently you posted, um, was it a men's physique athlete turned pro? Um, oh, now. classic. Classic physique. Classic. Yeah. Was that this past weekend? Yeah, this past weekend, the OCB show, I think South Carolina. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that, that was, it, everything worked out perfectly fine. I mean, um, you know what it is, what's funny is like being an enhanced athlete myself in the past and helping enhance, we have a different level of idea of conditioning. Mm. So when I'm dieting natural guys, sometimes I always keep that in mind that like the level of hardness is not necessarily going to be achieved outside of their genetics. Mm. So but I always strive to have like really, really good condition with my natural guys where yeah, fortunately most natural shows you go to people are like seven weeks out. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like yeah. they're just not in shape and some people shouldn't even be on stage at all. Yeah. Uh, some natural shows. So I, I always try to really bring that condition. And I mean, luckily all my natural competitors last year and this year, like 90% of them all won for that reason. Wow. A couple of my pro natural guys, obviously, it's a different story that at the pro ranks because guys yeah, at the pro do. level, it seems like they're even more conditioned than in correct. The exactly, exactly. Um, and, the, and the top pro guys are are just you know cream of the crop genetics, and they figure things out. So, but I've had you know top five guys compete and do well at the uh, at the pro level at the naturals. But yeah, it's exactly. It's kind of like out of shape completely to yeah. like extremely in shape. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What, what do you find are some of the differences in, in prepping a natural athlete? You, you, do you take longer? Do you have 100%. to be more careful? Like, how do you? Look? Well, because they don't rely on exogenous forms of testosterone, you can't exactly bottom out their dietary fat for extended period yeah. of time. I mean, everybody at a natural show is going to be pretty much hypogonadal um, and low testosterone. It's just, <laughs> it's just how it is yeah. because you don't have that exogenous form going in. So I, I really try to cycle fats. And I do it at a much slower pace. Mm. Um, you have to do it at a slower pace because you got to really maintain their training performance. Their performance goes down. Their sex drives goes down. Their sleep goes down. You're going to get a natural athlete that just looks like flat, stringy, no muscle hardness. Um, so I generally do 20 weeks, um, a, a longer period of time, unless they're freaks. I mean, I've had some genetic freak natural guys that like dieted for a month and then won the entire show and then did a pro show the week after and got like second. You know what I mean? Like, some people are just born a Ferrari. You know what I mean? <laughs> Some people are born a Volkswagen Beetle. You know what I mean? So nice. Like, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> kind of like the person who's born a millionaire, right? They don't know what it's like to have to earn that million dollars. They already yeah. have it. Yeah, yeah totally. Um, and I would love to talk a little bit about your electrolyte product uh, more. What made you start an electrolyte, electrolyte product and how did you formulate it? Yeah, so like one of the biggest issues I have, even with bodybuilders, but mainly general population is getting enough water intake per day. And many people might understand this, like when you start to eat a healthier diet, you generally eat a higher fiber diet. Higher fiber diet does require adequate hydration, water intake. Most people are too busy. They don't want to pee so much. Um, they don't like the taste of water. It's not like the bodybuilding discipline where they do, they'll just eat like frozen broccoli if they have to, to get a result, right? So you have to almost create an incentive, uh, incentive for people to do a certain action to help their health. So 
Mio is something that, you know, everybody knows they add to the water, helps them drink more water. But I've had a lot of complaints. In the fl- I don't like the taste. I don't like the flavor. So I was like, man, like I should, I'm recommending this product so much to so many people. I should probably try to create my own with a better flavor system that has a just touch of minerals in it that's yeah. going to aid in hydration, but it's not going to be the amount of minerals that would cause any issues with hypertension. Or if you overconsume all day long, you're not going to get chubby fingers. You're not going to retain water. So my mineral profile is just enough to increase the hydration rating of a solution outside of it just being water, right? Got um, it. Yeah, I was going to ask because it seems lower in electrolytes than a lot of the common products on the market, but it makes perfect sense when you're talking about right. like something more habitual um, to flavor right. the water and keep you hydrated. Right. Like some of these hydration drinks and powders, like you're not going to put that in your gallon of water and drink it all day long and then consume 4,000 milligrams of sodium. Like, yeah, that's not the point of their product. The point of the product is a small niche group who's exercising hard for one or two hours in hot weather that needs a substantial amount of electrolyte replacement or intra during to maintain where my product is more like you add it to your water, you drink all day long. You don't have to worry about it. Yeah. Yeah. But it's funny not to mention though, a lot of the, I, since I created this, I've had so many people message me. They're like, Oh, I took element T and look at my ankles and their ankles are like this big. Yeah. Some people get some nasty side effects because they're using it improperly. Um, And they're over-consuming and that amount of sodium is just not needed. You know, you don't need a thousand mgs of sodium for a 45-minute workout for a general population client. You just don't need that, you know? Yeah, I have to be careful because Elementi is actually a sponsor. But um, yeah, yeah, there's definitely different situations, like you said. Right, right. right. It's meant for something. (laughs) Uh, But some people will just take it because it tastes good and add it to their water, you know? Yeah, totally. Totally Um, understand. Yeah, so this is like, uh, mine's like, it's not like we're, it's not a sports drink. It's just like I said, it's to help aid in hydration, incentivize water. I have lemonade, I have sweet tea. Um, and the reason we came up came as flavor so you can make an Arnold Palmer and mix them together. Oh, nice. Yeah, we got blue raz coming out and mango peach. But uh they're the, everybody loves the flavor, like they like the flavor much better than Neo. So that, yeah. that was our that was our main goal. Yeah, that's awesome. That's great. Yeah, I think it's really smart. Um, and always cool when you come up with a product. <laughs> from your own experience or your experience working with clients. I think that's awesome. Yeah. And how, shifting topics a little bit, how did you get linked up with Milos for the IFBB AMA podcast? I listen to every episode and really enjoy it. Um, so we were on the same uh, group, like me, Evan, Milos, were like the original guys creating content. Um, and Milos was like, we, it, we, we were all creating content educational info for our sponsor. and he was like, Hey, what do you guys think about doing a podcast? We think your personalities are so different and you being a younger generation bodybuilder and Milos being old school, that it would be a good combination to put together for a discussion. And I said, I'll give it a shot. So, and that's how it started. Um, It was a a proposal idea um, to see if it would work other than just creating content and videos. Because think about it. If you're just creating content of education and training, it becomes redundant, right? You start to kind of like repeat things or make things, not make things up, but like you're wording things differently and it's the same concept. So we decided to shift gears away from the content. Evan still does content um, and educational stuff because Evan's just a world of knowledge and he's really good at uh, explaining stuff for people to understand. So Milos and I are doing the podcast and it's been, it's been good, you know? Yeah, I think it's, that's really funny that that's why they approached the two of you or uh, the two of you came together because you are, you are quite different, but um, yes. it works really well. Um, yes. A lot of podcasts, it's like two of people, same age, same background, same beliefs, same history. And it's cool to get a little bit of a contrast. Yes, 100%. 100%. Uh, one thing you talk about a lot, Chris, um, which I think is really essential and um almost underappreciated is exercise execution. Um, why do you think that's so important and what mistakes do you see being made a lot um, with like new clients who come to you? Yeah. So, I mean, looking back at my own history of progression, when I stopped training like an idiot weightlifter and worrying about just weight, my body tra- uh, uh, changed super fast. Um, but there was like a breaking point there, meaning I started to get injured. And then I'm like, well, if I'm injured, I'm not growing anything. 
So how do I make this weight harder on the muscle that I'm targeting? So I don't have to go as heavy. And I started to do that. And when I started to do that, I went from, you know, winning my class to winning overalls back to back. And then I went right to my first uh, pro qualifier, North Americans, got fifth. And then my second pro qualifier, my first year trying to become pro and I won and I got first. So my body changed dramatically fast within like wow. 18 of change of changing my training because now I was actually training like a bodybuilder, not just slinging weight around like a weightlifter. There are bodybuilders that still train like that. They get results because they're genetics. Yeah. But it's going to come to a point where like I tell everybody is how you train and how you treat your body is going to extend that shelf life of your body mm -hmm. because your body can only tolerate so much beating for so long. You're yeah. never going to, you're very rarely ever going to meet somebody that's been training hard and heavy and in their fifties not have problems. Yeah. Like I can't even tell you people I know that in their fifties who can't even lift their arm above their head wow. because the shoulders are destroyed yeah. and look back. They all say the same thing. I wish I didn't do four or five shoulder presses. Yeah. I do need to do that because it was irrelevant to bodybuilding. It's not required. Yeah. It's not important. Um, and the other thing is like, you see so many people like go through the same exercises, routines as everybody else. And some people are getting substantially better results than other people outside of mm -hmm. genetics. One distinct difference that you notice with people who said they're getting good results. Most people in that bell curve is they're training with controlled motions. Mm -hmm. They're controlling the weight. They're moving the weight with a the muscle. They're not just working the movement. We've yep. all seen people in the gym that position themselves to be the most mechanical advantageous they can to lift the lowest load they can. Most and people. They move, right, right, most people. And they move at a rate of speed to get the most reps, but they're not feeling shit. Yeah. Um, and as soon as you back off the weight, slow them down, they're like panicking because like it's so much harder. Like yeah. you do 15, 20 controlled reps on a hack squat versus a heavy, fast eight reps. Fast eight reps, that's for children. Like that's easy. Yeah. yeah. But you do 15 slow reps, you're going to throw up on yourself. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like- it's 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 so much more demanding on the muscle. Anybody yeah. can exert themselves extremely hard for 10 seconds, right? Mm -hmm. But like you try to exert yourself hard and reach near muscular failure, you know, in a set that's lasting 30 seconds to 60 seconds, it's a whole nother ball game. Yeah, absolutely. That's something I've adopted in my own training. Um, just I, I got into bodybuilding a little bit late and I'm 31 years old and just preparing for my first show now. Um, and I've had a few injuries uh, my body's still pretty beat up from, from eight years of rowing and chronic cardio. Um, and especially because I'm shorter and I have very short legs relative to my torso, I'm very strong on leg movements. Um, and so I found myself getting up to, you know, five or more plates on a Cybex hack squat. And, uh, you know, it, it was just so much toll on my body. And I had to, had to think about like, how can I make this harder going really deep pausing in the hole, um, really slowing down the eccentric. And I, I just got excellent results and less fatigue and then started applying it to my other body parts too. Um, and it's really helped me. Well, you just said something very important for the listeners. When you train super heavy, you really do tax your CNS, your central nervous system, yeah. which really hinders your recovery. And in a week, you have a recovery budget. And do, do it explains it the best. You have a budget. And how you handle your training sessions will greatly determine how much of that budget you have left. Where a lot of people will go over budget and they can't recover enough to continuously grow. Yeah. So you have, to, you have to micromanage your training to focus on the weaker parts and back off the, the stronger parts to manage that budget and sh shift that funding all to the areas you need mm. to improve. So that's a perfect example. And not to mention how much res uh, research now is showing that hypertrophy is more associated with volume and frequency accumulation than just load, right? Mm -hmm. It's like lifting heavy, heavy, heavy weight. You can only get so strong, yeah. right? Yeah. And yeah. then eventually you're going to have to increase volume and then eventually frequency. So if you adjust the load and you're able to train a little bit more volume and recover, and then eventually work with higher frequency, you're going to accumulate more muscle faster than yeah. just going to the gym, trying to blitz six reps with sloppy dumbbell presses, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And of course, if you're injured, you're not growing anything. Yeah. It's not going to wait for like eight, 10 weeks before you can do it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Injuries can be so debilitating uh, emotionally too. <laughs> yeah. A hundred percent, you know? Yeah. 
Now, how many people just will train through the pain, right? They're like, yeah. I did too. I, that's, how, that's how I destroyed my knees. But like, um, they will just train through the pain or work around the injury, but in the improper way. We're like, I can't squat, but I can hack squat with a little pain. So I'll do hack squat. And then all of a sudden, two months go by. Shit, I can't do hack squat anymore, but I can do leg press. Yeah. And then we get to the point where like they can't even bend down. You know what yeah. I mean? Then it's going to take six months or sometimes even longer to get all that back. <clears throat> yeah. It's something I learned the hard way through rowing for three of my years. I had really bad back injuries and I decided to just take a leave every single day and work through it. And, you know, it ruined my GI system. Uh, my, I had horrible uh, hormonal issues coming out of rowing, um, which is why I actually started TRT. Um, and, and it was just really bad. So <laughs> I learned from that. Isn't it amazing? Like this perfect example. And then that, that translates to any sport or any, uh, avenue of training is when you keep pushing when you should be pulling back. Yeah. And then once you keep pushing so far, you dig yourself so far into a hole that either permanent damage is done or you have to take a massive break. Yeah. A massive break. Versus yeah. if you take two steps back, you might take four steps forward, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I wish I had known that when I was 19 years old and just wanted to make the first boat. <laughs> I know. I like, but that's where you get when you're younger. You're so emotionally driven. Yeah. You're like, I, need to do I was the same way. That's why yeah. I messed up my body so much as I did now. And I always try to tell my clients, it's like, Chris, you're so knowledgeable. I'm like, yes, yeah, because I made a lot of mistakes. <laughs> I'm <laughs> yeah. trying to teach you so you don't make the same damn mistakes. Yeah. It's how the deepest lessons are learned. <laughs> yeah. The school of hard knocks. Yeah. Um, so I'd love to talk about your approach to an off season, um, Chris. And, and maybe we can start with like immediately post show. Um, and kind of the rebound. Um, and I'd love to talk about like, what's your preferred way to do it. And it was really interesting. I was just listening to you on a podcast with Justin Harris, um, where I, you started talking about this and I expected you to disagree because Justin is very much with his athletes, a fan of like, do, do the six to eight week rebound believes you get most of your gains in that period, but you actually agreed that like you need to take a longer, slower approach, which is really interesting and think about the off season as a whole. Um, but a, a lot of people, a lot of coaches, it's, it's um, kind of a meme to say you're going to gain a ton of weight um, post-show. So you might as well do it with moderate androgens in um, and you're going to get 70 to 80% of your off season gains in like the six weeks post-show. Um, but uh, others like John Jewett and um, Austin Stout talk about going to something closer to like a TRT or a TRT plus um, because you're going to get great gains anyway. You're so insulin sensitive and you, just through food, um, you can you can reset, you can reduce allostatic load and then set yourself up for a longer off season. So I'm curious what your preferred approach is and how do you think about, about rebounds with your clients? Um, I, I, in my personal experience and experience helping people over the years, so you can call it anecdotal, obviously this is all yeah. anecdotal, is that post-show rebound should not be used as a growth phase. It should be used to prepare your body for an extended, successful off-season. Yeah. There's a few reasons for this. One, your blood markers are an absolute mess <laughs> when you're exiting a show. Due yeah. to usually heavy oral use and high AIs, your HDL is probably in the bucket. LDL is probably still high regardless of being a calorie deficit. Um, most people will carve up and binge out for at least a week after the show, right? Which obviously sends your lipids through the roof. It's a mess. Your liver is taking a hit. Your body is just not internally in a health standpoint prepared for a push of calories and drugs. It's yeah. just not. People do it. And some people get decent results, but overall, I know I've reviewed some studies with natural bodybuilders that post-show rebound, actually zero muscle was grown wow. and it was all intracellular water and fat. Yeah. Because most of the time when people start to see that weight increase post-show and they're still lean, your body will retain an astronomical amount of water in the muscle and the cells. And you get swollen. You and look like you're gaining muscle. You look like you're huge. Like, dude, I yeah. got a top brush in my teeth. I'm so yeah. jacked. This is crazy. But you're actually not. It's mm. water. Because everybody will reach a point post-show, five, six weeks, where they start to get a little softer. 
and they lose that huge rebound of water retention within the cells, that overcompensation, and they don't have that full round look. And then they're like, oh crap, I think my gear's fake or I, I don't know what's happening. I feel like I'm now I'm smaller than I was before. What's going on? It's water, right? Yeah. That's what I mean, Anadrol makes you look so round and full because yeah. it's water, but you pull it out and then a week and a half, that goes away. So yeah. the health standpoint, the body's just not prepared. You put your body through the ringer. You know, some people might have done an hour and a half of cardio and gone really low calories. Is that for somebody that's potentially ready to do a rebound? No. Now, on a small percent of people, say they had to do 20 minutes of cardio and their carbs never got low below like 300 and they weren't even, they didn't even accumulate much fatigue and their cycle wasn't really aggressive at all. Could they potentially do a rebound? Possibly. Mm -hmm. But like most people are not in that situation. Yeah. Like I've had clients go through the last six weeks in prep, do zero cardio, and they're yeah. eating food into the show the last three weeks. Yeah. And then once they get to the show, they're not fatigued at all. Yeah. And yeah. Because their fatigue was managed, their cycle androgen load was low. And they're like, hey, can I do a post show rebound? I'm like, provide me lab work that yeah. says you're ready. And then we can do it. And I mean, I think only three people in the last like three years were able to do that. Their lab work genetically just came back really good. Yeah. And they felt fresh. So we did do a rebound, but the rebound was just like 400 makes a test. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. We're not hitting a full cycle. But yeah. anyway, majority of people, that eight weeks, 10 weeks post show should be designed to maintain a good appetite, reverse any side of digestive issues that happens in prep because everybody gets some type of depletion of the gut microbiome and their digestion's a little off. Uh, fix sleep. At most, everybody gets starts to get poor sleep habits when they're in prep. They can't sleep very long. They're getting up really, really early. Um, getting over that relationship, the, you know, reestablishing their relationship with food where they're not like binge eating or crazy. Their body's rested. Their joints are fresh. So then you get to 10 weeks and they're still very lean. Then they can hit the gas with food and a progressive linear state, gear, and training over the next six months and get way more results than that six months than someone's going to get in that eight weeks. Yeah. You know, it makes a ton of sense. Yeah. And most importantly, longevity. I know bodybuilders think they're going to live forever, but obviously that's not the case. Yeah. So, you know, they don't really think of the full intended consequences of what potentially they're going to do if they jump on D ball and Anadrol after a show and, you know, skyrocket their body weight and blood pressure. Because let's be honest, it's not good for your heart or your blood pressure. And most bodybuilders have a high blood pressure when they do this is when they gain 30, 40 pounds in the eight weeks post-show. Your body yeah. just can't handle that type of weight gain in that short period of time. Yeah, they think it's funny, they think it's great. And then they email me when they're in their 40s and they have renal failure. And they're like, oh, I got to fix this. I'm like, dude, you're, you're done. You're cooked. Yeah. yeah. Speaking of that, I've had at least 30, 40 clients, bodybuilders over the years, 40s and 50s, with you know chronic kidney disease from wow. exactly this. Wow. From not managing their blood pressure. And then they come to me thinking that I'm a dietitian. I'm going to fix them. You can't fix your kidneys. You cook them, you cook them. You yeah. can you can delay the time you're going to need a kidney transplant for sure. But bodybuilding's done. Like you're, you're, yeah. you're over, you know? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. Um, and, and so it makes a ton of sense. I, I completely agree. And, and then how do you go up setting up a successful off season from there? Like, how do you decide what to progress first? How do you decide when to pull back? Yeah. So, you know, it, obviously it's always based on your, the client's response. You get some people that just keep responding, responding, responding. They don't need to pull back, but generally, obviously fat gain is inevitable, but you want to control the rate of fat gain and making sure that obviously they're progressing in the gym with frequency and volume, being able to recover. And you're actually seeing the difference in size that's occurring, gradual weight gain. Do I have any like set weight gain parameters? Not necessarily, but I don't want anybody gaining two pounds per week. You're just going to get fat. Um, if they'll start a cycle, obviously you might be gaining water retention. Sure. But the most important thing for me when I look at from week to week basis from the week one of off season is making sure their appetite and digestion are maintaining, their sleep is maintaining, and they're getting solid training sessions. It's a performance-based approach. So their training performance should be progressively getting better. I, that's number one. 
uh, digestion should be on point, their appetite should be maintained, and sleep should be great. You're going to get to a point sometimes in the off season where appetite starts to decline. They might start to feel sluggish. Sleep starts to break down because of the weight gain and they're so full. And that's usually when somebody needs to pull back. Yep. And and um, what what's your preferred approach to pulling back? Like, do you like to do an aggressive mini cut or how do you think about that? Um, I never do an aggressive mini cut. I will pull back calories for a week. And when I say pull back calories, I might, if somebody's really high calories, I could pull back a thousand calories. And now like, obviously someone like Jordan, he's 300 pounds, right? Yeah. Thousand calorie drop is not a big deal, <laughs> you know? Yeah. But if somebody's eating 2000 calories or 2,800 calories, I'm not going to pull back a thousand, right? Yeah. I might pull back 600, 500 and add a little bit of cardio. But one thing I do do with a lot of my guys now that I never used to is I encourage pretty intense cardio through the entire year, like short duration, intense cardio. Um, because you lose your cardiovascular shape, you can't train nearly as hard. Yeah. And everybody always reports, bro, six weeks into a prep, I feel amazing. I can mm. train so hard. Well, yeah, you got to train like that all year. So I do implement anywhere from 20 to 25 minutes of cardio and um, heart rate or RPE. Heart rate might be anywhere from 140 to 155. Um, RPE, I like to have them around like a six to a seven or seven to eight even. Okay. Um, but if somebody's in that reset format, like of pulling back calories, I'll bring that cardio to seven to an eight or eight to a nine. We're like, they're cranking for 15 to 18 minutes, yeah. um, four or five times per week. I also encourage step count because a lot of bodybuilders like to sit around and do nothing, but yeah. like that's only going to be detrimental to their digestion, their appetite, and some if they're going to get more rapid fat gain. If they maintain a good, decent, low intensity output, like they can just grow so much better. I mean, Jordan this year, we maintain, I think around 8K steps, 7K steps, and we maintain cardio. And he reached 300 pounds, never lost his appetite ever. Um, we were push food higher than ever. And his gear load overall was less than last year. Wow. Uh, so like it was, and then his sleep was better because you get the cardio in there, you get the steps in there, blood pressure is going to be lower. Sleep's going to be better. Digestion's going to be better. They can eat, you're going to train harder. And that all works in synchronization of each other to get the best overall result. Most yeah. people worry about, Food, scale, drugs, training, you know, like weight training. Like we got to focus on all the pieces to the puzzle. <clears throat> yep, absolutely. And what's your approach to nutrition in the off season? What do you think you do differently than, than other coaches? <sighs> Milos is going to kill me for saying this, but I don't go as much protein. <laughs> okay, yep. <laughs> I don't do that much protein um, or I adjust the protein to that situation. So for example, if somebody's hungry, which is not very common, but it's, it's relatively common. Mm -hmm. And there tend to be somebody who puts on a decent amount of fat quickly. I will have their protein a little higher than say someone like Jordan. Yep. You know, Jordan puts on weight quick. He puts on fat quick. Um, and, uh, but he's still able to manage his body comp. So I tend to add more carbohydrates, more carbohydrates, more carbohydrates for him. Um, and protein will really vary on that person. But like, I'm usually around 1.25 to 1.5 grams of pound per body weight. And that's usually if they're gently lean, if they're, if they can't see their abs, I'm not giving them 1.5, right? Yeah. I might go a little, a little lower scale and I adjust the protein too, based on appetite. Like I've had people down to one gram of pound of protein per body weight in the off season because their appetite was poor. And if you can't eat, you're not going to yeah. grow. But if yeah. I can reduce the protein load and increase, excuse me, increase fats and pro, uh, carbs to help them get the calories and to gain weight, then we're better off that way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It doesn't make sense to just jam down eight, 10, 12 ounces of protein a meal. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know people swear by that and they do that and like to each their own. Um, I just haven't seen the true benefit. I haven't seen it. And I know Jewett's low, way lower protein guy than the vast majority of people and look at the results he's getting. Yeah. So it's like, and I, I'm friends with him. We discuss this, we talk about it. And, you know, if, if he's not seeing the difference and I'm not seeing the difference, I don't really buy it. Um, yeah. and preparation might be a different animal, right? Making sure that you have a surplus of protein for a reason. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I just don't, I think in the off season, I don't think anybody needs to eat like 600 grams of protein. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and s- similar question for PEDs. What, what's your approach in the off season and, and how do you think it's, it may be different from others? Um, I don't like using orals. I, I don't okay. recommend people using orals. Um, I tend to kind of take more of like a, a Jew approach where it's like more DHT derivatives and testosterone. Um, NPP and DECA can have an application, but a lot of people have problems with DECA and NPP. Um, most off, obviously, sex drive changes, you know, stimulates prolactin, but a lot of people report being very manic. I mean, me personally, mm-hmm. as I got older, I couldn't take NPP or DECA at all. Like, yeah. I take NPP three weeks, it's great. And by week four, I'm like, my mood's up, my mood's down, my pumps are up, mood's down, I'm very watery. And even when I try to take, you know, something to lower uh, prolactin, it still wouldn't fix the problem. I just didn't feel great on it. So I tend to err on the call. I I tend to err on the side of like androgens that people have experience with where they feel excellent. It's like, hey, man, what cycles in the past have you run where you just feel amazing? Mm -hmm. Like, you don't get very minimal side effects. And then they'll tell me, like, okay, we're going to run with that then. Because any cycle you feel like shit, you utilize side effects, it's going to impede progress. It will, you know? Um, I, I, I just, the, the whole approach of throwing the kitchen sink at it and seeing what sticks to the wall is just, it's not on my level of integrity. I can't do that, yeah. you know? Yeah. It's smart. Um, I think that's why people work with you for so long. <laughs> yeah, I have a good, very good client retention and I care about my clients. And, you know, some of my clients that left me from other more aggressive coaches with drugs, we're still friends, we're cool. They tell me what they're doing. I'm just like, whether it's working or not, I would never recommend anybody to do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's just, that's just not what I'm about. Yeah. Yeah. There's life beyond bodybuilding too. <laughs> I, I tell people that. I'm like, dude, you got 10 years and then you're going to want to do something else. Yeah. Especially me being who I am and having so many clients after bodybuilding come to me and having regrets. So like, dude, I wish I checked my blood pressure. I wish I did this. I wish I knew this information then. I never checked my lab work. I just ran Anadrol on and off all year. Like, you know, because people were just taking recommendations from the guy who's selling it or the guy yeah. who's just promising straight results, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned blood pressure and organ imaging too, because I think there's a trend also in the industry to just talk about blood work. And it's like, oh, I'm getting my blood work checked. Oh yeah. Make sure you're getting your blood work checked. And yes, that's totally part of the picture and it's very important, but I think it's, I think blood pressure can almost be more important and it's something that like you can do, like you, you shouldn't be not checking your blood pressure. Is one right. Point. Right. It's not invasive. It's easy. Yeah, 50 bucks yeah. machine, bring it home. Yeah. Correctly learn it. Um, but everything matters, man. People think blood work yeah. is normal. like my dad's a physician and he tells me all the time. He's like, Chris, I get patients that have hurt blood work and they have a heart attack next week and they die. Yeah. Like um, you, it's, it's more to it than lab work. Like, you yeah. really should be doing lab work is good to see what's going on. Checking blood pressure is mandatory, but doing heart imaging and doing echocardiogram, checking the thickness of your left ventricle wall, your ejection fraction, seeing those things over time is important because there's a lot of people who avoid blood pressure, uh, checking their blood pressure, the heart becomes fatigued, the heart gets thickened, the chamber gets smaller, the ejection fraction goes down, then they have congestive heart failure. Yeah. And I've worked with tons of people that had that issue um, from other coaches. They're like, dude, my ejection fraction says, um, you know, 30% or 25%. They're like, I have heart of like a 70 year old. Wow. You know, and they reversed it. You know, you get the blood pressure under control, lo- drop some body weight, you get the excess fluid off the body, less pressure for the heart to push against. And you can help that a lot, but I mean, some damage to the heart's been done. Yeah. So it's very easily preventable with these measures, you know, and people are like, oh, you're going to get results. Dude, it's not all about results for one, but two, there's other ways up the mountain besides the hardest way on your body. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm i grateful for the education I've had because I've only been doing this like three years and I've had two echoes done. Um, and the first one, my ejection fraction was low. Um, I think it was like 48, 49, so borderline. Um, and I had some biventricular hypertrophy, um, maybe some dilation. And then... Uh, year and a half later, I had another one. Everything was great. Um, and I owe some of that to Telma Sartan. I think it helps a lot with cardiac yeah. remodeling, um, which I started then. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's absolutely essential. 
um, to be getting that type of work done. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And like like you said, it's better to know this and do this in the beginning from the get go instead of because there's some damage that you could do that you just can't undo. Yeah, yeah. It, it's amazing um, to your point around having perfect blood work. A few weeks ago um, in prep, I spent a week in the hospital with COVID. Um, I had to be put on oxygen. Oh, jeez. Uh, yeah, I, it was it was awful. It was the sickest I've ever been by far. I was sleeping less than an hour a night. I, I was, I was, had every symptom you could imagine. Um, and the first thing they do in the emergency room is they get all my blood work done. Everything's perfect. <laughs> Hell, so, right? It's, it's like, like you're dying in the hospital. Your blood work's perfect. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's funny. You know, middle of prep, sick as ever, and perfect blood work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um and then w- transitioning out of off season um and we, we won't have time to go through prep but i just wanted to ask you about like pre-prep what do you like to do with your bodybuilders at the end of an off season do you like to hold a certain body weight do you like to get a little bit of the fluid and fat off combination of the two how do you think about that before starting a prep almost every single bodybuilder that i help for prep will always start a transition of some nature to some degree of aggressiveness 20 weeks out. Okay. They're not prepping for 20 weeks. Yeah. Some people might, if they're way out of shape, which I never let my off season guy get that out of shape. But if somebody's coming to me to do a prep, um, I would obviously start the pre-prep phase, which I call that too, pre-prep yeah. where you are bringing calories down to near maintenance or you're finding that maintenance. Yeah. You know, I slowly bring the calories down, making sure training performance is maintained. And many times their training performance improves because as food goes down, their weight might go down a little bit, which improves sleep Mm. and they sleep better. They feel better. They don't have all that food digesting, which is less burden on the overall body. And now their performance is skyrocketing. Great. That's what I want. And then I'll keep training the calories down. Until that point where like, I can now I can really start to see you visibly leaner. And then I'll bring the calories back up just a smidge until we're actually in prep. Mm. So that way, when I start prep and I make the first change in the first week, there's instant results. Yep. Because many people that prep people understand that there seems to be this lag period sometimes. Mm. You go from say 4,000 calories a day and you cut it down to 3,000 and nothing happens. <laughs> You're like, yeah. I'm hungrier. I lost three pounds of water and I feel flatter, but I'm not losing any fat. Yeah. You go another week and you still don't lose any fat. And you're like, wait a minute, what's going on? I'm yeah. doing cardio. I'm not losing any more fat. And there's like that lag period because probably has to do with more not being super insulin sensitive. That Your body's still very saturated with glycogen and energy. And it takes so mode, that fat burning mode to turn on. Yeah. So it's, yeah. So yeah, that's always, exactly always, what I did this year too. Um, yeah. So I always do the pre prep process. So that way they're ultra responsive when I make any sort of slight change actually entering into prep. And I always tell my guys, like, listen, this isn't going to be a prep of two hours of cardio a day. I'm not yeah. doing, I don't want to get more than 45 minutes of cardio a day, ideally, and less even if I have to. Um, but I want you, I always tell them I want them lean 12 weeks out. They should have good ab definition 12 weeks out. So 12 weeks out, ideally, I want somebody to lose really no more than 15 to 20 pounds. Like I want them to be around that. So that way they're ready at three or four weeks out. And now we can start rinsing off fatigue, reducing car- reducing to eliminating cardio, and then bringing food progressively back in. Yeah, And then they just get harder and grainier and training starts to improve. And then they just get, then they're super dry eating 400 carbs a day. And they're one week out, you know, like, great. Yeah. You're in an excellent position because when the body's full of fatigue, water, you're super flat at seven days out. Now your peak week's going to be a little more tricky yeah. because you don't necessarily know how your body's going to respond when you start implementing things back in as far as carbohydrates and changing, you know, rest, full rest periods at the end of the week. So I like them to have all ready to go. Like my natural guy who just competed, we did exactly that. Two weeks out, started reduced cardio increasing calories. His body tolerated great. He started to actually trend down in weight, which you're so confused about, but that's fatigue being rinsed off. Body yeah. getting rid of the excess water. He's starting to look better. He's sleeping better. He's feeling better, looking better. We did a trial carb up on Friday and Saturday just to get an idea of how he would respond. 
He responded wonderfully well. And then I depleted him for Monday, Tuesday, when, uh, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. And then Wednesday was an extremely high carb day. Um, we're like 370, car- 370 grams of rice um, per meal. Uh, we use some butter, real butter for saturated fat, chicken steak, foods he was carb up before, cream of rice. I always incorporate fruit in a carb up to help okay. um, get electrolytes in there, of uh, potassium. And of course, help them shit because you eat a bunch of rice and chicken, you might start to not be able to shit. Yeah. And I don't have to eat any vegetables those those days. And then okay. Thursday was a repeat day. And then Friday, I pulled back the food slightly. That way they can get rid of any sort of distension in their stomach from eating so much food. And they shit like three or four times on Friday because they ate so much on Wednesday and Thursday. And then Saturday morning, it was just like, he woke up. I'm like, dude, everything's fine. Like, yeah. just don't change anything. Awesome. All that same meal plan and Perfect. limit water or 250 mLs of water per meal, and then just run with it. And he did it yeah. and he got better and better as the day went on and he won everything and it was perfect. But there was no yeah. guessing, right? It was kind of yeah. like systematic. Very, very intelligent, very planned. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's excellent. And uh that's kind of what I'm hoping to do too. Um, I, I haven't done any cardio yet, and I think I'm had a schedule. Um, so hopefully I'll get there by three weeks out. Um, yeah. Oh, but sure. yeah, I've, I've started gaining weight this week, which is a bit of a mind fuck. <laughs> well, uh, partially probably could be after COVID too, right? You know, your body's yeah. like a little coming back from that. Totally. Totally. Um, but, uh, one last thing I wanted to ask you is, um, the trade-off between competing every year and taking multiple year off season. Um, some coaches think it's best to compete every year. You get lean, you reset your insulin sensitivity, you set yourself up for a really great effective growth phase. Others think, you know, it's better if, if you need to really put on the weight to step up a uh, class or step up within your class, take, take a full off season. Don't put yourself through the fatigue of a prep, you know, find a way if you need to get lean in the middle, do it, but don't, don't compete just to get lean. Um, how do you kind of think about that with your athletes? I think everybody should compete no later than 18 months. Okay. Because that that's going to bring in a four month prep, right? So yeah. n- now you're down to like 14 months of on actual okay. off season. Yeah. So anywhere like uh, people need, if you really try to run a substantial mass, 12 months is appropriate, but 12, I mean, 12 total months before you start a prep, I'm saying. Yeah. But like 12 months, you take away four months. That doesn't leave you a whole lot room to recover and grow. Right. Yeah. So 18 months, I think, would be the max, in my opinion. When people go too long, they just get super stale. Yeah. They really do get super stale. Makes and sense. most people don't follow through with that cut process or mm-hmm. reset process. Okay. Because they're so obsessed with their body weight. Oh, dude, yeah. I'm, I'm not using, I can't waste any time. I, I got to grow. Yeah. But it's trying to get heavier out. and heavier. Yeah. Yeah. I, we, we, okay. I mean, Jordan this year has grown more in like four hold on a second he's grown more in this five months than he did a year and a half the year before wow because we did do an extended off season because after uh he got his pro card when he USA's he needed to put on a substantial amount of muscle mass and he did I mean we stepped on stage around 225 at USA's and then we we're around 240s um, for uh, his Texas Pro. But this time, he's going to be probably 15 pounds heavier again. What do you attribute that to? Those that five um, We're learning more and more of what he needs to do and better training. Like, I drilled into him, man. Like, it's about managing fatigue in the offseason, but being able to progress with load volume frequency. Mm-hmm. and able to recover so like really choose your exercises wisely as we previously discussed right yeah it's like can you ha- squat sure but should you squat heavy deadlift and heavy barbell row on the same week probably not a wise choice yeah. where you could cycle those exercises to make sure you're maximizing recovery we we also did an extra with the extra mile and making sure his sleep is perfect okay because yeah. you get too heavy sleep deteriorates so CPAP machines on all the time. His yeah. sleep schedule is on the time. I said, dude, you got to go to bed at the same time every night and get up at the same time within an hour, but you got to stick to a strict sleep schedule. And that way your food schedule will be consistent, which will help your appetite. 
And now his training schedule is consistent. So everything in the department of sleep, digestion, appetite, keeping body fat low with cardio and um, lower managed, I'd say not lower, I would say managed with cardio and step count has ultimately provided that environment for way better training. Yep. And the way better training has resulted in this because we were plagued with a few injuries last year, like overuse stuff, but we're able to mitigate all of that and have legitimately consistent progressive training sessions every week for weeks. Okay. Like every week he's like, dude, I'm gaining more reps and more reps and more reps of the same weight, like almost every week, wow. which before it was constantly like stuck, injured, yeah. hurt my doctor. It's like, listen, we got to rethink how we do this. So I'm like, as we yeah. said before, I'm like, bro, you're getting so strong that like putting like eight plates in the hack squat each side, it's not going to be feasible anymore. Right. Yeah. So it's like, why don't we do seven plates, a reverse band and go slower with a pause at the bottom, you know, do 15 to 20 reps and really focus on the muscle instead of just worrying about pushing weight. And now it's just, it's, he's just expanding. Wow. Great. Well, thank you so much, Chris. This has been phenomenal. Um, awesome. I've learned a ton and I'm sure the audience is going to love this. Uh, where can folks follow along, find more about you, get, get the electrolytes, um, and anything else you want to plug? Yep. Um, so if you guys want to try more, you can go to drink more, uh, drinkmore.com. And in regards to uh, me, Chris Tuttle.rd on Instagram. I also have my total nutrition business page on Instagram, which I rarely ever update. I'm, I'm so bad at posting clients because mainly, man, I'm just so focused on my clients that for me, posting doesn't help me in yeah. regard to like business or whatever. And, and it's nice to post things, but I do sometimes. It just takes so much time. Yeah. Um, we, my wife and I have a business, Total Equity. Um, it's like investment investment business into like properties and such. So cool. you guys can take a look at her as, there as well. Um, and of course my website, totalnutrition.com, go through there. But I will, I'll let everybody know, I do have a four month wait list. But if you are interested, email me to be put on that wait list. Don't wait four months because it's still going to be a wait list regardless. <laughs> um, but yeah, and I help all sorts of people with clients. I don't uh, I don't discriminate. Like I have some tough cases, some insulin dependent diabetics that I help, um, both competitors and non competitors that take a greater greater time period to help manage their their A one C and their insulin and their glucose and all that stuff. So. That's uh it's it's fun in my opinion because it's it's a more more clinical challenge. Cool. Yeah, yeah, definitely interesting. Great. Well, thanks again, Chris, and hope you have a fantastic rest of your day. Thanks, buddy. Take care. Thank you for listening to the show. You can find the Scott My Show on Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. Please leave a comment, like, review, or share the podcast with your friends or followers. It helps more people find the show. 